Chapter twenty seven, part two of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume three, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter twenty seven, Civil Wars, Reign of Theodosius, part two. Constantinople was the principal seat and fortress of Arianism, and in a long interval of forty years the faith of the princes and prelates, who reigned in the capital of the East, was rejected in the purer schools of Rome and Alexandria. The archiepiscopal throne of Macedonius, which had been polluted with so much Christian blood, was successively filled by Eudoxus and Demophilus. Their diocese enjoyed a free importation of vice and error from every province of the empire, the eager pursuit of religious controversy afforded a new occupation to the busy idleness of the metropolis, and we may credit the assertion of an intelligent observer, who describes with some pleasantry the effects of their loquacious zeal. This city, says he, is full of mechanics and slaves, who are, all of them, profound theologians, and preach in the shops and in the streets. If you desire a man to change a piece of silver, he informs you, wherein the son differs from the father, if you ask the price of a loaf, you are told by way of a reply that the son is inferior to the father, and if you inquire whether the bath is ready, the answer is that the son was made out of nothing. The heretics of various denominations subsisted in peace under the protection of the Arians of Constantinople, who endeavored to secure the attachment of those obscure secretaries, while they abused, with unrelenting severity, the victory which they had obtained over the followers of the Council of Nice. During the partial reigns of Constantius and Valens, the feeble remnant of the Homosians was deprived of the public and private exercise of their religion, and it has been observed, in pathetic language, that the scattered flock was left without a shepherd to wander on the mountains, or to be devoured by rapacious wolves. But as their zeal, instead of being subdued, derived strength and vigor from oppression, they seized the first moments of imperfect freedom, which they had acquired by the death of Valens, to form themselves into a regular congregation under the conduct of an episcopal pastor. Two natives of Cappadocia, Basil and Gregory Nazanianzen, were distinguished above all their contemporaries by the rare union of profane eloquence and of orthodox piety. These orators, who might sometimes be compared by themselves and by the public to the most celebrated of the ancient Greeks, were united by the ties of the strictest friendship. They had cultivated, with equal ardor, the same liberal studies in the schools of Athens. They had retired, with equal devotion, to the same solitude in the deserts of Pontus, and every spark of emulation or envy appeared to be totally extinguished in the holy and ingenious breasts of Gregory and Basil. But the exaltation of Basil, from a private life to the archiepiscopal throne of Caesarea, discovered to the world, and perhaps to himself, the pride of his character, and the first favour which he condescended to bestow on his friend was received, and perhaps was intended, as a cruel insult. Instead of employing the superior talents of Gregory in some useful and conspicuous station, the haughty prelates selected, among the fifty bishoprics of his extensive province, the wretched village of Sassima, without water, without verdure, without society, situate at the junction of three highways, and frequented only by the incessant passage of rude and clamorous wagoners. Gregory submitted with reluctance to this humiliating exile. He was ordained bishop of Sassima, but he solemnly protests that he never consummated his spiritual marriage with this disgusting bride. He afterwards consented to undertake the government of his native church of Nazianzus, of which his father had been bishop above five and forty years. But, as he was still conscious that he had deserved another audience, and another theatre, he accepted, with no unworthy ambition, the honourable invitation which was addressed to him from the orthodox party of Constantinople. On his arrival in the capital, Gregory was entertained in the house of a pious and charitable kinsman. The most spacious room was consecrated to the uses of religious worship, and the name of Anastasia was chosen to express the resurrection of the Nicene faith. This private conventicle was afterwards converted into a magnificent church, and the credulity of the succeeding age was prepared to believe the miracles and visions which attested to the presence, or at least the protection, of the Mother of God. 
The pulpit of the Anastasia was the scene of the labors and triumphs of Gregory Nazianzen, and, in the space of two years, he experienced all the spiritual adventures which constitute the prosperous or adverse fortunes of a missionary. The Arians, who were provoked by the boldness of his enterprise, represented his doctrine as if he had preached three distinct and equal deities, and the devout populace was excited to suppress, by violence and tumult, the irregular assemblies of the Athanasian heretics. From the cathedral of St. Sophia there issued a motley crowd of common beggars, who had forfeited their claim to pity, of monks, who had the appearance of goats or satyrs, and of women, more terrible than so many Jezebels. The doors of the Anastasia were broken open, much mischief was perpetrated, or attempted, with sticks, stones, and firebrands, and as a man lost his life in the affray, Gregory, who was summoned the next morning before the magistrate, had the satisfaction of supposing that he publicly confessed the name of Christ. After he was delivered from the fear and danger of a foreign enemy, his infant church was disgraced and distracted by intestine faction. A stranger, who assumed the name of Maximus, and the cloak of a cynic philosopher, insinuated himself into the confidence of Gregory, deceived and abused his favorable opinion, and forming a secret connection with some bishops of Egypt, attempted, by a clandestine ordination, to supplant his patron in the episcopal seat of Constantinople. These mortifications might sometimes tempt the Cappadocian missionary to regret his obscure solitude, but his fatigues were rewarded by the daily increase of his fame and his congregation, and he enjoyed the pleasure of observing that the greater part of his numerous audience retired from his sermons satisfied with the eloquence of the preacher, or dissatisfied with the manifold imperfections of their faith and practice. The Catholics of Constantinople were animated with joyful confidence by the baptism and edict of Theodosius, and they impatiently waited the effects of his gracious promise. Their hopes were speedily accomplished, and the emperor, as soon as he had finished the operations of the campaign, made his public entry into the capital at the head of a victorious army. The next day after his arrival he summoned Demophilus to his presence, and offered that Arian prelate the hard alternative of subscribing to the Nicene Creed, or of instantly resigning, to the Orthodox believers, the use and possession of the Episcopal Palace, the Cathedral of St. Sophia, and all the churches of Constantinople. The zeal of Zamophilus, which in a Catholic saint would have been justly applauded, embraced, without hesitation, a life of poverty and exile, and his removal was immediately followed by the purification of the imperial city. The Arians might complain, with some appearance of justice, that an inconsiderable congregation of sectaries should usurp the hundred churches, which they were insufficient to fill, whilst the far greater part of the people was cruelly excluded from every place of religious worship. Theodosius was still inexorable, but as the angels who had protected the Catholic cause were only visible to the eyes of faith, he prudently reinforced those heavenly legions with the more effectual aid of temporal and carnal weapons, and the church of St. Sophia was occupied by a large body of the imperial guards. If the mind of Gregory was susceptible of pride, he must have felt a very lively satisfaction, when the emperor conducted him through the streets in solemn triumph, and with his own hand respectfully placed him on the archiepiscopal throne of Constantinople. But the saint, who had not subdued the imperfections of human virtue, was deeply affected by the mortifying consideration that his entrance into the fold was that of a wolf, rather than of a shepherd, that the glittering arms which surrounded his person were necessary for his safety, and that he alone was the object of the imprecations of a great party, whom, as men and citizens, it was impossible for him to despise. He beheld the innumerable multitude of either sex, and of every age, who crowded the streets, the windows, and the roofs of the houses. He heard the tumultuous voice of rage, grief, astonishment, and despair, and Gregory fairly confesses that on the memorable day of his installation, the capital of the East wore the appearance of a city taken by storm, and in the hands of a barbarian conqueror. About six weeks afterwards, Theodosius declared his resolution of expelling from all the churches of his dominions the bishops and their clergy who should obstinately refuse to believe, or at least to profess, the doctrine of the Council of Nice. 
His lieutenant, Sapper, was armed with the ample powers of a general law, a special commission, and a military force, and this ecclesiastical revolution was conducted with so much discretion and vigor, that the religion of the emperor was established, without tumult or bloodshed, in all the provinces of the East. The writings of the Arians, if they had been permitted to exist, would perhaps contain the lamentable story of the persecution which afflicted the church under the reign of the impious Theodosius, and the sufferings of their holy confessors might claim the pity of the disinterested reader. Yet there is reason to imagine that the violence of zeal and revenge was, in some measure, eluded by the want of resistance, and that in their adversity the Arians displayed much less firmness than had been exerted by the orthodox party under the reigns of Constantius and Valens. The moral character and conduct of the hostile sects appear to have been governed by the same principles of nature and religion, but a very material circumstance may be discovered, which tended to distinguish the degrees of their theological faith. Both parties, in the schools as well as in the temples, acknowledged and worshipped the divine majesty of Christ, and, as we are always prone to impute our own sentiments and passions to the deity, it would be deemed more prudent and respectful to exaggerate than to circumscribe the adorable perfections of the Son of God. The disciple of Athanasius exulted in the proud confidence that he had entitled himself to the divine favor, while the follower of Arius must have been tormented by the secret apprehension that he was guilty, perhaps, of an unpardonable offense, by the scanty praise and parsimonious honors which he bestowed on the judge of the world. The opinions of Arianism might satisfy a cold and speculative mind, but the doctrine of the Nicene Creed, most powerfully recommended by the merits of faith and devotion, was much better adapted to become popular and successful in a believing age. The hope that truth and wisdom would be found in the assemblies of the Orthodox clergy induced the emperor to convene, at Constantinople, a synod of one hundred and fifty bishops, who proceeded, without much difficulty or delay, to complete the theological system which had been established on the Council of Nice. The vehement disputes of the fourth century had been chiefly employed on the nature of the Son of God, and the various opinions which were embraced concerning the second were extended and transferred by a natural analogy to the third person of the Trinity. Yet it was found, or it was thought necessary by the victorious adversaries of Arianism, to explain the ambiguous language of some respectable doctors, to confirm the faith of the Catholics, and to condemn an unpopular and inconsistent sect of Macedonians, who freely admitted that the Son was consubstantial to the Father, while they were fearful of seeming to acknowledge the existence of three gods. A final and unanimous sentence was pronounced to ratify the equal deity of the Holy Ghost. The mysterious doctrine has been received by all the nations and all the churches of the Christian world, and their grateful reverence has assigned to the bishops of Theodosius the second rank among the general councils. Their knowledge of religious truth may have been preserved by tradition, or it may have been communicated by inspiration, but the sober evidence of history will not allow much weight to the personal authority of the fathers of Constantinople. In an age when the ecclesiastics had scandalously degenerated from the model of apostolic purity, the most worthless and corrupt were always the most eager to frequent and to disturb the episcopal assemblies. The conflict and fermentation of so many opposite interests and tempers inflamed the passions of the bishops, and their ruling passions were the love of gold and the love of dispute. Many of the same prelates who now applauded the orthodox piety of Theodosius had repeatedly changed, with prudent flexibility, their creeds and opinions, and in the various revolutions of the church and state, the religion of their sovereign was the rule of their obsequious faith. When the emperor suspended his prevailing influence, the turbulent synod was blindly impelled by the absurd or selfish motives of pride, hatred, or resentment. The death of Meletius, which happened at the Council of Constantinople, presented the most favorable opportunity of terminating the schism of Antioch, by suffering his aged rival, Paulinus, peaceably to end his days in the episcopal chair. The faith and virtues of Paulinus were unblemished, but his cause was supported by the western churches, and the bishops of the synod resolved to perpetrate the mischiefs of discord by the hasty ordination of a perjured candidate rather than to betray the imagined dignity of the East, which had been illustrated by the birth and death of the Son of God. Such unjust and disorderly proceedings forced the gravest members of the assembly to dissent and to secede, 
and the clamorous majority which remained masters of the field of battle could be compared only to wasps or magpies, to a flight of cranes, or to a flock of geese. A suspicion may possibly arise that so unfavorable a picture of ecclesiastical synods has been drawn by the partial hand of some obstinate heretic, or some malicious infidel. But the name of the sincere historian who has conveyed this instructive lesson to the knowledge of posterity must silence the important murmurs of superstition and bigotry. He was one of the most pious and eloquent bishops of the age, a saint and a doctor of the church, the scourge of Arianism, and the pillar of the Orthodox faith, a distinguished member of the Council of Constantinople, in which, after the death of Malicious, he exercised the functions of president, in a word, Gregory Nazanianzen himself. The harsh and ungenerous treatment which he had experienced, instead of derogating from the truth of his evidence, affords an additional proof of the spirit which actuated the deliberations of the Synod. Their unanimous suffrage had confirmed the pretensions which the Bishop of Constantinople derived from the choice of the people, and the approbation of the Emperor. But Gregory soon became the victim of malice and envy. The bishops of the East, his strenuous adherents, provoked by his moderation in the affairs of Antioch, abandoned him, without support, to the adverse faction of the Egyptians, who disputed the validity of his election, and rigorously asserted the obsolete canon that prohibited the licentious practice of episcopal translations. The pride, or the humility, of Gregory prompted him to decline a contest which might have been imputed to ambition and avarice, and he publicly offered, not without some mixture of indignation, to renounce the government of a church which had been restored and almost created by his labors. His resignation was accepted by the synod and by the emperor with more readiness than he seems to have expected. At the time when he might have hoped to enjoy the fruits of his victory, his episcopal throne was filled by the senator Nectarius, and the new archbishop, accidentally recommended by his easy temper and venerable aspect, was obliged to delay the ceremony of his consecration, till he had previously dispatched the rites of his baptism. After this remarkable experience of the ingratitude of princes and prelates, Gregory retired once more to his obscure solitude of Cappadocia, where he employed the remainder of his life, about eight years, in the exercises of poetry and devotion. The title of saint has been added to his name, but the tenderness of his heart and the elegance of his genius reflect a more pleasing luster on the memory of Gregory Nazanianzen. It was not enough that Theodosius had suppressed the insolent reign of Arianism, or that he had abundantly revenged the injuries which the Catholics sustained from the zeal of Constantius and Valens. The Orthodox Emperor considered every heretic as a rebel against the supreme powers of heaven and earth and each of those powers might exercise their peculiar jurisdiction over the soul and body of the guilty. The decrees of the Council of Constantinople had ascertained the true standard of the faith, and the ecclesiastics, who governed the conscience of Theodosius, suggested the most effectual methods of persecution. In the space of fifteen years he promulgated at least fifteen severe edicts against the heretics, more especially against those who rejected the doctrine of the Trinity, and to deprive them of every hope of escape, he sternly enacted that if any laws or rescripts should be alleged in their favor, the judges should consider them as the illegal productions either of fraud or forgery. The penal statutes were directed against the ministers, the assemblies, and the persons of heretics, and the passions of the legislator were expressed in the language of declamation and invective. 1. The heretical teachers, who usurped the sacred titles of bishops or presbyters, were not only excluded from the privileges and emoluments so liberally granted to the orthodox clergy, but they were exposed to the heavy penalties of exile and confiscation, if they presumed to preach the doctrine, or to practice the rites of their accursed sects. A fine of ten pounds of gold, above four hundred pounds sterling, was imposed on every person who should dare to confer, or receive, or promote, an heretical ordination, and it was reasonably expected that if the race of pastors could be extinguished, their hopeless flocks would be compelled, by ignorance and hunger, to return within the pale of the Catholic Church. 2. The rigorous prohibition of conventicles was carefully extended to every possible circumstance, in which the heretics could assemble with the intention of worshipping God and Christ according to the dictates of their conscience. Their religious meetings, whether public or secret, by day or by night, in cities or in the country, were equally prescribed by the edicts of Theodosius, 
and the building or ground which had been used for that illegal purpose was forfeited to the imperial domain. 3. It was supposed that the error of the heretics could proceed only from the obstinate temper of their minds, and that such a temper was a fit object of censure and punishment. The anathemas of the church were fortified by a sort of civil excommunication, which separated them from their fellow-citizens by a peculiar brand of infamy and this declaration of the supreme magistrate tended to justify, or at least to excuse, the insults of a fanatic populace. The sectaries were gradually disqualified from the possession of honorable or lucrative employments, and Theodosius was satisfied with his own justice, when he decreed that, as the Eunomians distinguished the nature of the son from that of the father, they should be incapable of making their wills or of receiving any advantage from testamentary donations. The guilt of the Manichaean heresy was esteemed of such magnitude that it could be expiated only by the death of the offender, and the same capital punishment was inflicted on the audience, or quartodecimans, who should dare to perpetrate the atrocious crime of celebrating on an improper day the festival of Easter. Every Roman might exercise the right of public accusation, but the office of inquisitors of the faith, a name so deservedly abhorred, was first instituted under the reign of Theodosius. Yet we are assured that the execution of his penal edicts was seldom enforced, and that the pious emperor appeared less desirous to punish than to reclaim or terrify his refractory subjects. The theory of persecution was established by Theodosius, whose justice and piety have been applauded by the saints, but the practice of it, in its fullest extent, was reserved for his rival and colleague Maximus, the first among the Christian princes who shed the blood of his Christian subjects on account of their religious opinions. The cause of the Priscillianists, a recent sect of heretics, who disturbed the provinces of Spain, was transferred by appeal from the Synod of Bordeaux to the Imperial Consistory of Treves, and by the sentence of the Praetorian Prefect, seven persons were tortured, condemned, and executed. The first of these was Priscillian himself, Bishop of Avila, in Spain, who adorned the advantages of birth and fortune, by the accomplishments of eloquence and learning. Two presbyters and two deacons accompanied their beloved master in his death, which they esteemed as a glorious martyrdom, and the number of religious victims was completed by the execution of Latronian, a poet, who rivaled the fame of the ancients, and of Eurotia, a noble matron of Bordeaux, the widow of the orator Delphidius. Two bishops who had embraced the sentiments of Priscillian were condemned to a distant and dreary exile, and some indulgence was shown to the meaner criminals, who assumed the merit of an early repentance. If any credit could be allowed to confessions extorted by fear or pain, and to vague reports, the offspring of malice and credulity, the heresy of the Priscillianists would be found to include the various abominations of magic, of impiety, and of lewdness. Priscillian, who wandered about the world in the company of his spiritual sisters, was accused of praying stark naked in the midst of the congregation, and it was confidently asserted that the effects of his criminal intercourse with the daughter of Eurotia had been suppressed by means still more odious and criminal. But an accurate, or rather candid, inquiry will discover that if the Priscillianists violated the laws of nature, it was not by the licentiousness, but by the austerity of their lives. They absolutely condemned the use of the marriage bed, and the peace of families was often disturbed by indiscreet separations. They enjoyed, or recommended, a total abstinence from all animal food, and their continual prayers, fasts, and vigils inculcated a rule of strict and perfect devotion. The speculative tenets of the sect, concerning the person of Christ and the nature of the human soul, were derived from the Gnostic and Manichaean system, and this vain philosophy, which had been transported from Egypt to Spain, was ill-adapted to the grosser spirits of the West. The obscure disciples of Priscillian suffered languished, and gradually disappeared. His tenets were rejected by the clergy and people, but his death was the subject of a long and vehement controversy, while some arraigned and others applauded the justice of his sentence. It is with pleasure that we can observe the human inconsistency of the most illustrious saints and bishops, Ambrose of Milan and Martin of Tours, who on this occasion asserted the cause of toleration. They pitied the unhappy men who had been executed at Treves. 
they refused to hold communion with their episcopal murderers, and if Martin deviated from that generous resolution, his motives were laudable, and his repentance was exemplary. The bishops of Tours and Milan pronounced, without hesitation, the eternal damnation of heretics, but they were surprised and shocked by the bloody image of their temporal death, and the honest feelings of nature resisted the artificial prejudices of theology. The humanity of Ambrose and Martin was confirmed by the scandalous irregularity of the proceedings against Priscillian and his adherents. The civil and ecclesiastical minister has transgressed the limits of their respective provinces. The secular judge had presumed to receive an appeal, and to pronounce a definitive sentence, in a matter of faith, and an episcopal jurisdiction. The bishops had disgraced themselves, by exercising the functions of accusers in a criminal prosecution. The cruelty of Ithacius, who beheld the tortures, and solicited the death of the heretics, provoked the just indignation of mankind, and the vices of that profligate bishop were admitted as a proof that his zeal was instigated by the sordid motives of interest. Since the death of Priscillian, the rude attempts of persecution have been refined and methodized in the Holy Office, which assigns their distinct parts to the ecclesiastical and secular powers. The devoted victim is regularly delivered by the priest to the magistrate, and by the magistrate to the executioner, and the inexorable sentence of the church, which declares the spiritual guilt of the offender, is expressed in the mild language of pity and intercession. End of chapter 27, part 2